hello everyone. Simon, congratulations on the award. Uh, Renata, thank you for putting this together and the Curiosum team. I'm excited to speak to you all again. Uh, I think I have something that is gonna be very valuable um, with this presentation, which is unlocking three secrets to developer productivity. So let's get started. I'm gonna share my screen here. All right, so let me know in the chat if you can see my screen, because I'm gonna go full screen. Unfortunately, so last time I was excited about being able to read the chat. I haven't figured out how to use Keynote and be able to see the chat this time. So, okay, you guys can see. Unfortunately, I won't be able to respond in real time like I normally will, or like I did last time. But uh, I do think that this is going to be uh, high value. Uh, so buckle up. Uh, we're going to get into some emotions today about the nature of our craft. And uh, let's get let's get to it. So my name is Joshua Plick. Hello. And in general, when I look at my life and I analyze myself, my birthday was recently, I just turned 32. And what I've come to understand about myself is that I am very interested and very attracted to game-changing outcomes. As you heard, uh, in my free time, I play poker semi-professionally. I enjoy the risk of that. I enjoy the decision-making. Uh, I, I love the, the aspect of, even if you make all the right decisions in, in a game of poker, everything can go wrong because of bad luck. Uh, I enjoy the lessons that come from loss, and I enjoy the euphoria that comes from winning. So once again, I'm Joshua Plick. I'm the CEO of a small Phoenix Live View consultancy. There's four of us in the United States. And uh, we've been recently working on creating a new website, which has got me thinking about who are the kind of people who would click on our website and want to do business with us. And so when you have a software consultancy or a software house, you or and especially if you're doing marketing, you create what are what are called user personas, which are kind of just like constructions of people who are visiting your website and maybe doing business with you. And so the three things that uh, someone would engage a firm like mine or Curiousum is off, if you're using off the shelf software and it's like you're growing too fast and it you need custom software. Another one is just a brand new app idea. You have a startup idea. You want to go from idea to reality. And then finally, and what we're going to focus on during this presentation is Project Rescue. So Project Rescue is really interesting because what would inspire a company to bring in an entirely different team to work on their code base? And what leads to Project Rescue, what makes companies so desperate that they're going to engage an outside firm is because it means that everything has gone wrong. Development has slowed to a crawl. And essentially, the, the code base itself is at a point where nobody can deliver value anymore. But that's what makes my perspective and uh, consultants more interesting. It's because many developers can get away with uh, hiding inside of organizations or not delivering value. But as a company that comes in for a project rescue project, we have to hit the ground running. We're, we're hired guns, we're goons, mercenaries, sell swords. We can't afford to not deliver value. And the reason why is because very quickly, we're going to get fired or we're not going to be paid for our work. And so as consultants and as outsiders, we have a unique perspective of and a unique culture, a, a unique subculture within software development as to how we deliver value quickly. And I want to share that perspective with you today. Uh, before, the, before this presentation, I was talking with Simon about a concept called inside baseball. So in the United States, we have a term called inside baseball, which is within certain sub communities, you have like what's called tribal knowledge, where you have inner knowledge that nobody else knows. And so today, what I'm going to be revealing to you all is the nature of how a consultant comes in and hits the ground running and why that's useful to everyone and how we unlock that productivity at large for all of our organizations. So many years ago, I was an apprentice at a software development shop and one of the senior devs turned to me and I was probably crying about something or we were talking about something. 
And his, his, the guy's name uh, is Michael Woods. And he turned to me and he told me something that I'll never forget. This was maybe six or seven years ago. And he said, Josh, our primary objective is to ship working software. And so the reason why he was having this discussion to me is because we were working on something and we were time boxing our work. Because remember, as, as consultants, we have to deliver value. We have to get out there. We have to ship. And so what he was trying to tell me was the concept of time boxing in regards to, hey, we're going to work on this. We're going to try and make this better for the next 45 to minutes to an hour. And if we can't make it better, we're going to ship with what we have. Because at the end of the day, we, as sell swords, as mercenaries, we must deliver. And so I think a lot of us forget that at the end of the day, our, our objective as software people is to ship working software. And I know that sounds very obvious, but here's why I know it's not obvious. Well, actually, we're going to get into that. Well, let me just say that the name of this presentation is Three Secrets to Developer Productivity. And as an outsider who is paid to come in and clean up messes, I have determined through years of experience that the primary reason in a technical speech today, the primary reason why things don't get done in an organization is because of emotions. In a technical organization, in a world as software developers, we live in a world of black and white and yes and no and true and false, but it's the emotions, our underlying, our motivations as to why we're not productive. And in this presentation, I'm gonna unlock, unlock that for you. Because at the end of the day, many of us work in organizations where our code base is, it locks us up. And it, like when I was at my previous company, Zencase, which is a legal practice management startup, I used to, as a recruiting tool, I used to tell people on the phone or during interviews that our code base looks like this. So it was a Ruby on Rails application we had been working on it for six years. It had 97% test coverage after six years, and it had been upgraded across from Rails 4 to Rails 5 to Rails 6. And the reason why we were able to achieve this is because of the techniques that I'm going to show you in this presentation. So without further ado, how the heck was I able to maintain, because at the time I, I was the first employee, I ended up becoming an engineering manager, head of engineering, and hiring six other developers. And we remained highly productive and our code base looking like this as opposed to this was a major recruiting tool and this is why i know that this presentation is going to be valuable to you because most of us live in this and i was selling people on living in a situation like this and it's possible for you gray beards in the chat i just turned 32 i've been in this field for nine years if there's anybody who would say that you can't have a, a very nice application after many years of development, it would be it it would be me to say that at this point. And I'm telling you that that's wrong. As a now, I'm I'm starting. I got two gray hairs on my beard now. I'm 32. I've got 10 years of experience essentially, and it is absolutely possible. And on this next slide, I'm going to show you what it is. Are you ready? I wish I could see the chat right now. <laughs> Uh, but I'm visualizing what you guys are saying. Bing bong. The open secrets are write tests, refactor your code, and never use your mouth. Ladies and gentlemen, those are the secrets. Now, a few of you gray beards just got pissed off or like, dude, we've been hearing about this for 10 years. I got 15 years of experience. Writing tests slows me down. We don't refactor because guess what? Like we have whole sprints devoted to that and we got to ship and refactoring. You're telling me that I got to do the same thing. When I write tests and I refactor, you're telling me that I'm writing more code, spending more time on something and ending up with the same results. I gave you a slide. Ode, out, ode to the gray beards. I get it. But I'm also a gray beard now. And I'm telling you that you're wrong. So. You mean to tell me that when I refactor, you know, I've already said this, but so I already jumped the slide, but when I refactor, I end up with a new structure to my code and the code works the same. And then I got my project manager, engineering manager, breathing down my neck, breathing down my back as to why I'm not shipping software. Same thing with tests. If I write tests, 
I'm writing double the code and I have the same result. Why the heck am I doing these things? And ultimately, the reason why you don't do these things boils down to the emotional nature of it and how you view it. Because that's how most of the field views it. Because guess what? Remember that that crazy image with the with the wires that were locked up? That's what your code base looks like. And it doesn't have to be that way. And the reason why it's because of your perspective. As someone who's a software consultant, I can't afford to have that perspective. I have to hit, come in, hit the ground running, and provide value to organizations that have hired us. And so I want to talk about a concept in the United States. Uh, in, in the 1800s, when miners would go into a coal mine, they would put a canary at the front of the mine. So there's a there's a chemical compound. It's a it's a gas. It's called carbon monoxide. And carbon monoxide, you can't smell it and you can't see it. And the beauty of the canary at the beginning of the coal mine, as they're like hacking away and mining, carbon monoxide gets exposed into the air. And it's very dangerous because you can't smell it and you can't see it. And it, it, it can very much kill you. And so what a canary is, a canary is a small bird, and they would put it at the front of the coal mine, or they put it in the coal mine and the canary would die first. And so that was an immediate alert to all the miners that, oh snap, like the carbon monoxide levels have become dangerous. We need to get the heck out of here. And so what I want to tell you about is the canary in the coal mine. I've been, I've as a consultant, I've seen dozens of applications at this point, probably 50 or 60 different applications. And I want to tell you the one thing that I see that tells me that an engineering organization is not shipping software. The canary in the coal mine, what does Joshua Plick see when he's employed to bring in and bring an organization from the brink of not being able to ship at all? And that thing is stale branches. So this is the Ruby on Rails repository. Stale branches are the number one indicator that an organization is not fulfilling the primary objective of a software developer, which is shipping working software. So the reason why, why is that uh, an indicator, stale branches? It's because it's work that was done that wasn't actually shipped. So that means there was no value brought to the organization. No, the customers, your users, the people who used the tool that you're building did not receive the value from you working on this project because it's a stale branch. It never got merged. It never got deployed. And that is the primary objective of our craft. And so why does that happen? And it boils down to emotions. I want to talk to you about my time when I was coming up in this craft. I was uh, early in my career as a Ruby developer. And for three years straight, I'd never missed a single meeting. And over that course of that three years, there was a, a night where we would come in and work on code together. It was called Open Hacks. And then there was also a speaker night. For, so for 36 meetings, I never missed a meeting. At the end of every speaker night, 36 of them, assuming, you know, I'm sure there was some that were canceled, but let's just say 36 of them in a row. I went to every single meeting. And at the end, the guy that was running that meeting, is a na his name is Micah Cooper. So the speaker would give a speech, boom, clap, clap, ask questions. Micah would then come up at, at the end of the speaker's speech and he would say, does anybody have anything that they're struggling with? And for three years straight, Joshua Plick, me, I was the only one who walked up, plugged in my laptop and showed the code and, sh and asked questions for three years straight. The problem and the reason why we end up with stale branches is because of pride. Our industry has a pride problem. We are either too prideful to ask or we're too scared at the results of asking the question. And so the key to this is humility. And so that was Joshua Plick as early in his career, right? I had nothing to lose. But what about Joshua Plick today? CEO of Or Equals and uh, developer consultant doing project, project rescue. Let me show you a Slack message. This is the Jacksonville Tech Slack right here. This is uh, Jacksonville is the, is the city that I live in the United States. This is September. This is exact, almost exactly one month ago from this presentation. Hey guys, I'm looking to Booleanify some code right now. Does Elixir have some utility for turning strings into Booleans? I, I almost feel like standing because this is so important because someone now, I have something to lose now. 
And yet our, our industry suffers from a pride problem. Here I am, someone who has some clout now, asking, openly asking, openly exposing myself to the world, being like, oh, he doesn't know how to do that. And so the reason why I ask this question is because guess what? Remember that Micah Cooper guy from early in my career? That guy came in and saved the day again. And he gave me a really great suggestion. In the Ecto library, there's a, a way. So, you know, I was talking about Boolean. It, it doesn't matter what the problem is. He answered my question. Thank you. I even dropped him a goat emoji. So that's a short in the United States for greatest of all time. We call it, So if you put that in the, its words, it's G-O-A-T. And so for short, we call that someone who is a goat, greatest of all time. And the reason why you guys suffer from a, a pride problem, and the reason why I'm saying you guys is because I know from, from logging in and downloading dozens of applications that we suffer from this as an industry. No one is willing to walk up at the end of a presentation and expose themselves. And in addition, the reason why you feel this way, right? So I'm being accusatory, but I un ultimately I understand. You don't wanna look dumb and you don't want appear to appear incompetent judgment you fear the judgment of your peers and you your superiors but the end result of that looks like this stale branches stale branches is the canary in the coal mine of an organization that doesn't ship and ultimately that is our greatest objective as software people we must ship the key to this of course is to be in a community and to ask for help and when you do ask for help you only have to be a fool for one day. And if you never ask for help, you're a fool for a lifetime. I'm just gonna pause there. That's, that's the number one thing that's plaguing our industry. And if you do that alone, hey, ask for help, network with your peers, at, like ship. If you don't ship, you weren't productive. And so, Let's just continue on from there. We've talked about it. We've added an additional one to the secrets, which was writing tests and refactoring and never using your mouse. And so let's talk about it, my fellow graybeards. Why don't you refactor? Why don't you write tests? And the reason why I know you don't is because I have looked at dozens of your applications and I know that the cultures and the organizations at large in our, in, in our field do not, in, it's in all the books. So Shasha has writ written books. He's given keynote speeches. He's the person speaking after this. He's told you people like the thought leaders in our field have told you that these things are very important. And yet, why aren't they being done, Graybeards? Once again, I'm leading with accusatory, but I, I want you to understand that I, under I understand you. The reason why is because your instincts are going off. I'm writing all this extra code for tests. I'm not shipping any value by writing tests. I'm refactoring something, but I, I'm ending up the same result. And ultimately, I, I want you to understand that I empathize with you. Testing is counterintuitive. How the heck are you telling me, Josh, Joshua Plick, that if I write tests and I refactor my code, ending up with more code and more work, how am I gonna end up being faster? How is this a key to productivity? So let's just talk about a CSV upload, a very common problem that is solved in software development. So let's say that your engineering manager comes to you and tasks you with doing a data import. You're about to ship a new version of your software. You did a whole big bang rewrite and you need to do a CSV upload of the data from the old system into the new system. Graybeards, you know, I know you, I, I've got your, your beards curled up right now, but give me a second, hear me out. We're gonna get there, okay? You've all done this before. And guess what? You write some code, boom. Oh, it doesn't compile. Oh, you write some code. Oh, I forgot that attribute. Oh, you write some code. Oh, it didn't save to the database. And how is it that you're confirming that it didn't compile or it didn't save to the database? It's because you're uploading the CSV to a browser, choose file, and you're uploading the file to the server. Or you're opening up IX and you're typing a command and uploading a CSV file. Ladies and gentlemen of the Elixir meetup from Curiosum, you're already writing tests, except you're always writing tests because every time you do a code change, you have to go to the browser, and you have to go to IX, and you have to do it over and over and over again. The key to productivity, just like 
if you ask questions and you're humble, you you're you're a fool for one day as opposed to a fool for a lifetime. If you write tests against that CSV upload one time, it works for you in perpetuity. No matter what changes, it, it protects you from change. But because you don't do it, you end up writing tests for a lifetime. So you pay that cost up front doing when you write the code initially, you write tests against it. And as it protects you and it documents the, the actual what is happening in this code base, the very first thing I do when I open up a code base is I go to the test suite. As you can tell, most of the time there's nothing there. But the best way to understand what a piece of code does is not by reading the code, it's by reading the test. It's because in functional program, programming, Elixir, it's input output. I can see what kind of data structures are gonna be going into this function, what are my perceived results? The, because you don't write tests, you have to test all the time. And so it's counterintuitive. I understand, I understand you. Hey, if I write tests, I'm not getting anything done. But guess what? You spend, I do less work than you. I do less work than you because you're sitting there always making sure, you're always, you live in fear. You're always looking over your shoulder. Like, oh man, like, did I break something? And what tests do is they give you, they liberate you. It's like a seeing eye dog. Like, have you ever been in the airport and you see a blind person? They've got the, the, the click, click clack of the, of the, of the rod, right? The rod with the, with the red tip. And then they've either got a dog with them. I don't have to be able to see because my tests see for me. I don't have to be able to test it in IEX. I don't have to upload a file because I just run my test. Boom, it's done in 0.1 seconds. You're in there going, uploading it into the browser, which takes you an ex extra 15 seconds. And because you broke the code once by not compiling, you broke the code twice by uh, not adding a, uh, an attribute to the CSV, you broke the code three times because you didn't actually save the, the attribute to the database. 15 seconds times three is 45 seconds versus me running the test. I write the test once, which may take me three minutes, and then I run the test and it takes 0.1 seconds to, to execute over every single day. We're talking about one example, something that takes you 45 seconds to test, takes me 3.3 .3 seconds to confirm. And this is the reason why testing is counterintuitive. And if you end up writing tests, you will discover that you are much more productive. Trust me, I understand why you don't do it. Like at the end of the day, it doesn't make sense. But if you do it, you're gonna end up sending me a LinkedIn DM. You're gonna send up send me an email. I've been coding for 12 years, and I you know I saw your presentation. You pissed me off. My gray beard was curled up, but you were right, Josh. Ultimately, ladies and gentlemen of of this presentation, I want you to know that just just write them and trust me. Because at the end of the result, you're going to understand that you're, you're going to be getting more done. Those stale branches, if you exercise humility and you write tests to confirm that you're actually solving the problem, you won't have to live in fear anymore. You, this leads into refactoring. So this is a piece of code called Dominatrix. And so here's some more inside baseball. This, what I'm about to say next probably hasn't been said in public before. So I used to work at a software consultancy um, and they do pair programming there. And at the time they charged $200 an hour. So as a result of code being locked up, the most profitable projects on the planet that are locked up end up all in these consultancies pockets. People are, they're billing $400 an hour to clean up your messes. And what I would like to reveal to you today is what the developer interview looks like to work at one of these consultancies. So this code is very hard to understand. It's got a lot going on. You've got a loop, you've got an early return, you've got or statements. The developer interview for that company is to, re this is Ruby, is to refactor this. The actual interview is a live refactor of code. And the reason why that's so profound is because this is why consultants are running circles around the rest of the industry and why the why these applications ends up end up in their hands. It's because they understand that refactoring, restructuring code is the one of the most primary and important skills you must have as a developer with experience. Now the reason why 
I'm ahead. This was, was my slide. The interview challenge was to li was to live refactor. And as consultants, we live and die by refactoring because guess what? When consultants are brought in, the code base looks like this. And by the end of it, piece by piece, every single day. So I was a Boy Scout, right? I was a Boy Scout, and one of the primary things that we were taught when you go and you set a campsite, you you camp there, you're there for the weekend, and you leave. You always want to leave it a little bit better than you found it. If there's a little bit of trash near the fire, near the near the fireplace, not the fireplace. This is not a house, but near the uh, near the campfire, you go and clean that up. And so you visualize how the campsite looked before you got there, and you just make it a little bit better. So it's not just giant refactoring swaths, like where we're just just restructuring everything. You're just doing it one one step at a time, one function, one module, just a little bit. And if every time you commit code, you're refactoring, you end up with something that looks a little bit closer to this. And so let's talk about the emotions, right? We've, we've spoken about pride. We've spoken about humility. We've spoken about testing. The reason why you don't refactor is because you don't have confidence. The reason why you don't have confidence is because you don't know if you're going to break something with your refactor. So I'm speaking to somebody right now. Somebody is hurt by what I'm saying, but I'm giving you the solutions. Listen to me. If you listen to the solutions, if you write tests, you don't have to live with this. What if I break something? I don't know this area of the code base. The reason why the developer interview for working at a consultancy that's billing $400 an hour is because we write tests to confirm this is the, I actually wrote a blog post around, about this. If you Google refactoring legacy Ruby on Rails controllers, it's a fairly boring article, but it's literally opening up the inside baseball of what a consultant actually does. You end up writing tests to document what a function does. Like say that, that, that really nasty function that we were looking at, this guy. You end up writing tests against all the code paths. Oh, the early return, um, hitting the each. And so you end up this, uh, just off of instinct, if I look at this method, I'd probably have 12 or 13 different unit tests. So you boom, you document to a test, document to a test. And then that gives you the safety. The reason why you don't refactor is because you don't feel safe. What if I break something? I don't know this area. I don't want my engineering manager breathing down my neck. You write tests and they will liberate you to refactor. And in addition to that, the reason why these two techniques are important is because tests help you define what you're actually solving. So we could get into test-driven development and the, the benefits of designing up front. But I live in the real world, guys. To me, that's academia. Of course, so you know, I could talk about test-driven development. I do think it's important, but most of you don't even write tests at all. And so that's what we're gonna focus. I'm trying to convince you that writing tests and liberate you to refactor. And once you're liberated to refactor, you end up with a code base that is actually a joy to work in. That's the re Remember, that was my recruiting tool. Hey, we have 96% test coverage. This is a really great code base to work in. It's six years old. The only way you do that is by sticking to the habits. And when it comes to refactoring, you can only refactor safely if you have tests to confirm that you're not breaking anything. Now, once you have tests, you, you're, 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 you're good, you're safe. You can literally just do whatever you want. And there's, all you, there's whole books on refactoring, 200, 300 pages long. You just need to worry about two small techniques, extract function, extract module. If you're in a function that's 30 lines long, just extract one of them. Remember, it's the Boy Scout principle. I want to leave my campfire just a little bit better than I found it. If you, every time you merge a pull request, your code base is in better condition, you're gonna end up with a code base that doesn't end up like that crazy picture with all the wires crossed. This is the secret. This is the open secret because you guys know this. You guys know these things. But because of pride, but because of the instinct that tests aren't gonna work, but because of fear of, of messing up and looking dumb, this is the difference. This is actually in the interview for uh, how, uh, developer becoming a developer consultant. This is the difference. If you do these things, you'll never have to see Joshua Plick's face again. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't it be nice to not have consultants and have a presentation like this? 
put me, I urge you to put me out of a job. Now, the, what's interesting about that is that most of you won't. Most of you are going to watch this presentation or most of you, most people aren't going to watch this presentation. Of those that watch this presentation, most people aren't going to actually do it. Don't be that person. Be the 5%, the 10%, the 15% of the people that are watching this that actually does this. Because at the end of the day, writing tests and refactoring is the key to remaining productive and it's going to make you more productive. I've, I told you that about writing tests. You guys write tests all the time. I write tests once and I know my stuff works. The reason why you haven't done it is because the instinct goes the other way. You feel, and it's a good, and I, 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 I want you to understand that it makes sense that you're writing more code or you're restructuring something, you're ending up with the same result. The problem with software is that it's always under change and it's always being read by somebody. So there's a proper popular phrase that code is written 10 more times than it is. It, no, it's written 10, or it's read code is written 10 more times than it is written. In addition to that, it's always under constant change. The one-two punch of testing and refactoring will give you the ability to be aggressive. I have a very aggressive coding style. I'm always deleting code. I'm always refactoring code. The only way I'm able to get, I'm, I'm able to maintain this aggression is by knowing that I'm right and I'm not breaking something. That's why adding that test coverage. Look, look that up, refactoring legacy Rails controllers. It's not that great of an article, but you'll there's a if you go to the bottom and you see the technique about how to actually how a consultant actually goes in and refactors something and or and it always starts with tests and then you can refactor. Remember, and refactoring doesn't have to be this crazy thing. You're just pulling things out one at a time, making it a little bit better. And then finally, I want to talk about our craft. Our craft in general, this is the most practical. So what I said was technique, was uh, high level. But what I'm going to get into is becoming better every day as a, as a part of your daily practice. And what that is, is never using your mouse. If you never use your mouse, for example, I was pair programming. Uh, I had I hired an apprentice about a year ago at Or Equals, and I was he was using Visual Studio Code, and he was I, I was pair programming with him, and I was watching him open up files, and like find what he was looking for, and then, oh, he opened up the wrong folder. He went to the another folder, and I was sitting there. I was watching him for like twenty seconds, and um, we have a one-on-one -on -one meeting every once every two weeks. I made note of it, and I said uh, I. I told this apprentice at the time, um, I said, you need to work on your mechanics. Like this is literally part of my like organ engineering culture, which is you need to be using command P or control P if you're on Windows for searching for files. And this, is, this extends to all areas of software development. So most of you do that, right? Most of you use control D or command D to select multiple things in VS Code or command P to search for files but it extends to everything. One of the most useful things that I've ever done is that I use this documentation tool, it's called Dash. And most of you, like for example, something that I look up often is enum.reduce. So enum.reduce has three parameters. I never know which one it is, which one's the accumulator, which one's the anonymous function, and which one is the list. And I always have to look it up. So if I Google it, I have to go to Chrome, especially if I'm using my mouse and I'm not using keyboard shortcuts like command tab, I gotta click, Chrome, click the plus sign for a new tab, type how or elixir enum.reduce have to read, figure this out. One of the best things I've ever done is download a documentation tool. I can just alt tab, boom, I can type reduce. And literally I'm, I've already got the documentation for elixir on my machine, on my computer, it's closer to me. I don't have to go to Google. If you never use your mouse, if you work on your mechanics, this is one of the most practical things that I'm saying in this presentation. If you make your mouse your enemy in this field, you will naturally become more productive. So as a result of this presentation, we've spoken about pride with regards to stale branches. We've spoken about testing and how counterintuitive it is, refactoring and why, that, why that's actually a, a premier skill as a consultant. You should expect to be slower up front. I understand the reason The reason why you don't stick to these things, the reason why organizations go years without these things happening, and 
in addition to that, I have to hold the managers, the CTOs, the VP of engineering's accountable for this. The reason why these, the reason why you're calling people like me in to clean things up is because you're not holding the line. You're not holding your people to this standard. This standard should be the standard across the entire industry. And I wish our industry had a, a bar exam, like, a, like to become a lawyer or to become a doctor. But we can't afford that because there's too much software to be written and there's not enough people that write it. I hope that I've inspired you to these, these open secrets to actually attempt to do them. You're gonna be slower if you're gonna be doing keyboard shortcuts and you're gonna be avoiding using your mouse in VS Code going forward. You're gonna be slower when you're writing tests because you gotta look up the syntax. You've never done it before. You're gonna be slower when you're refactoring because you're not gonna be just shipping. You're gonna be preparing for better shipping in the future. You should expect to be, slow, to be slowed down, but trust me, believe me, this is the key to productivity. And on the other side of this, your life will be like this. The reason why I'm able to speak to you so confidently is because these techniques, these mental models of viewing the world, they allow me to ship without fear. And that's what I wish for you and for your career. And these are the way, the, the, what we've discussed today is how it's achieved. Thank you. And yet again, a great presentation by Joshua. Uh, thank you very much. I, I agree with everything you said, basically. Uh, I even have a friend that um, took it to the next level when it comes to using just the keyboard. Uh, he, totally, he totally removed the mouse from his life when it comes to using the- No laptop. way! <laughs> the, the, the websites using only the keyboard and it was so advanced in, in how he did that with the Linux distribution that uh, I was already almost a university graduate, but I couldn't use the software. I was not able to do it because there were such a lot of shortcuts and uh, things that you had to type just to get into a program. It was totally unusable for, uh, for a person that wouldn't be pro in it. So you can right. to the next level. Uh, yeah, like that. It was a great presentation, really. Uh, I really agree with everything you said. Uh, I think that uh, asking questions in IT is really, uh, I, can, I could see that a lot of times, really a lot of times in terms of the junior developers, but even the regular developers, that if they really uh, asked a lot uh, and they exposed themselves, the learning curve was really high. Mm -hmm. And also someone in the comments section said that, but you also have to learn from the mistakes. It's also true. It's not mm -hmm. only about asking the questions, but also learning uh, from that and actually not doing the same mistakes all over again. Um, thank you very much. I'm just going to open the Q&A uh, right now so that if someone has a question, uh, you can ask it. So I already see one from Faith. Uh, as he said that he's always dealing with legacy code as a consultant. How did survive? How did he survive? Sometimes I would prefer to write from scratch, but I guess that is not an option for him. Uh, sometimes I don't, I don't know if I understand this question of Fatih. Fat um, I understand. Let me see if I can let me do my best. I don't fully understand this fatigue. Like try and reword it if you can. I understand this may be English, may be a second language. Um, dealing with legacy, legacy code, how do you survive? The reason, the way you survive as, as someone who's working in legacy codes, the very first thing that you do is that you write tests against the code paths of the code that you're about to execute change on. Like say, um, Say you've got like a filter of users and it's got uh, active users and inactive users. And then you wanna add an additional one for uh, soft deleted users. So what I would do first is I would get, most code bases that I get into don't have tests. So I'd write, I, I would write tests around the things that do work. And then I would implement my change, ensuring that I didn't break the other two filters, the active and inactive people. And then I know safely, I know I have, I have rock solid confidence that I've executed my change, all those filters work, and I didn't break my stuff. Um, 
So answering question from Hugo, are you more of a code than test person or a test than code person? That's a really good question. Uh, so what we're talking about is test-driven development at this point, which is uh, test-driven development is when you write your test first and then you write your code. I would say uh, at the integration test level, I usually write, I, I have like a nuanced answer to this, which is if I have integration level code, I end up writing the test just to give myself like a, my like say we're doing like a, a controller request and you're doing a create a, for an API where if it successfully creates, it returns a 200. If you're missing some parameters, you want to return a, a 422 unprocessable entity. What I would do is I would write two tests because like integration code is, has some annoying setup. I would write just two tests, like assert false, assert false. One of them is returns 200, returns 422. So I wouldn't like go through and write the entire test structure, but it would I would write the just the simple structure of what I want to achieve. So that gives me kind of like it limits the scope of my reality to, OK, I'm solving these two problems right now. And so at the unit test level, I do always do test driven development. The reason why is because the scope of what I'm solving is usually just function input versus function output. So essentially, I do test driven development at the unit test level 100 percent of the time. And then at the integration test level, I kind of use it as a way to form my thoughts about solving the problem. Uh, Milan asks also a really good question. Um, so I, let me, I'm going to get to Tomas's. Let's do Milan's first. Are you trying to have 100% test coverage? That is also an excellent question. That is not the goal. The reason why is because at a certain, there's a, uh, based on my experience, when you're writing tests, there's a, a certain, there's a concept in, I guess, human economics. It's called the law of diminishing returns, where when you work on something, um, say, um, Let's say, oh, like, let's say you're eating, right? You're eating um, at all you can eat. You're eating an all you can eat at a Chinese buffet or something. That's very popular in the United States. You get diminishing returns on your value of an all you can eat because when you go, you're very hungry. You're just eating. Da -da -da -da. You eat one plate, da -da -da. two plates. Da -da -da. That third plate, you may, you may want to consider getting half a plate of food because you're probably not going to eat that entire third plate. That's the law of diminishing returns because You've had all you can eat, which means theoretically you could eat forever, but you have diminishing returns because you only have so much capacity to consume that food and digest it. So in terms of test coverage, I've discovered that code bases re reach a level of about diminishing returns around 95% test coverage. Because at that point from that last 5%, you're usually having to do very difficult test setup, or you end up with what's called flaky tests, tests that fail sometimes to achieve that last 5%. So I would say that what I would aim for for most organizations is to achieve on a baseline 80% test coverage. A good level of test coverage is 90%. And then I would never try and go for 100% test coverage because it's gonna be, it's not gonna be worth it essentially. Testing, be, like you get just diminishing returns on your, your effort uh, if you start nearing 100% test coverage. Uh, Tomas asks, we have a project that touches multiple code bases. We have a project that touches multi implement an API where one code base is the client and the other is the server. That's also, man, you guys are killing it with these questions. Um, so with that, we, we use what's considered black box style testing. So like say you need to uh, upload an image to Amazon S3. The concept that you would use for this is to you is to create a um, is to create a mock of the API response because if you're having to spin up two applications, you may uh, you're going to in introduce latency in your test suite by having two processes that are running on your on your computer, or one sending a request and one's responding, and then you like it's what you want to do is create you want to test up into the boundary of your system up until like say the Amazon S3 example. You want to test up until the point where your API call is going to Amazon S3, and then you may want to test against when Amazon S3 returns a successful response or returns a, a failure response. So in your example, client server, I'd have tests for my client that uh, has a, a mocked out API, a very simple version of the real API, and I would test the client. And then on the server side, I would just, I mean, the server side is, that's what's serving it up. So you don't need to do any mocking or stubbing. So essentially instead of, and I've, I've tried to do this, where I've tried to spin up the client and the server, I would not suggest it, it's not worth it. You want to use the concepts of stubbing and mocking external services. That's the concept of, of when you're trying to test multiple systems. 
And then um, you may want to write one, what's called a smoke test. Like just right when you're going to deploy to production, just a very simple, like do these two things talk to each other. But most of the time you're going to just be mocking and stubbing. Uh, let's Let me see. also add something to it. It's, there's also something like in Alex, for instance, VCR cassettes, where you can actually record what's being returned from an uh, instance of the server. You can also try to use this kind of things because it tends to give you a better real time, uh, not real time, real data. Um, yeah, this is just another approach. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah, so that, that's an excellent, uh, that's a, a, an additional altern alternative to mocking and stubbing that is very powerful. It's a form of mocking and stubbing that like essentially Simon was saying is very realistic. Uh, what is your opinion on mock monkey patch for component and integration tests? Um, so I just talked about mocking um, and how I feel that it's very powerful for integration tests. Um, so yeah, my opinion is that it is a excellent technique for just confirming that the code within you can it's life, right? Like you can only worry about what you have control over. You can't be worried about what other people are doing. And the reason why, so say you did write your test to actually hit the real thing. The problem with that is what if that service goes down? So the service goes down and your tests are now failing, but they actually do work because you have tests that like you, you just can't control what you can't control. So the reason why mocking and stubbing is such a powerful technique is because it allows you to worry about the universe that you live in and that you have control over that, that code base. Next question by, from Bjorn, which is, how do you handle customer who sees tests as a waste of time and don't want to pay for that waste of time? That's, wow, that's an excellent question. Um, in that situation, so that uh, most of the time you're dealing, at least for me, I'm dealing with non-technical stakeholders, so they don't know. So you just write them anyway. But if you do have a customer who sees them as a waste of time, personally, I would say you should try and find someone else to do this. Most of the world doesn't write tests. Testing are like, remember my seeing eye dog example? Like I, I don't, I'm so dogmatic at this point in my career. I don't know how to write code without tests. Like I just, I, I don't know how, I won't do it. I can't, I can't like it because what tests do, they give me the confidence to know that my stuff works. It's not just, oh, like a right test to make, like I know. And so I, I'm, I'm empowered to refactor aggressively and safely so that, Essentially, that is a customer that's not for me. Essentially, I would put my foot down in that situation. No, we're not doing it. Like, if you think it's wasted time, like, go see someone else. Sorry. Uh, Gabriel asks, any tips on how to tackle? Oh, go ahead, Simon, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say that it's going to be the last question. Um, okay. After the presentation, I, I mean, after the QA, you can always answer the, um, the, the rest of the questions, but we will have to move on to Sasha. So okay, yep. that's the video. All right, last one. Any tips on how to tackle the learning curve of a test framework and technique? I asked that because I experienced colleagues and even myself dropped. Yes. So this is this is the standard practice, right, Gabriel? This is the reason why most of the field doesn't write tests, because it's like, oh, it's taking me it's taking me more time to do it. So in this situation uh, where you're dropping it to go faster, uh, I would just, so I would, as a consultant, we use the concept of a time box where we give ourselves two hours, one hour, 30 minutes to work on something. And then if you need to write it without test, you do it. Like, but essentially like that was the end of my presentation when I talked about like the advantage of like you're going, expect to be slower. You're struggling with the testing framework and learning about testing because you haven't done it before. It's just like when you learned how to code in general. It's a, it, it's something. It's, it, it does have a learning curve. So what I'm trying to convince you with this presentation is that on the other side of that is bliss. It's knowing that your stuff works, giving you the ability to refactor safely and with confidence. So if you're at that point now, just give yourself grace. Start writing a few tests. Just write like, just do unit tests. Like, um. You have to work with what you have, right? Like you have to work within the framework of the organization that you're in. So write tests sometimes and just start gradually getting into it. Um, but the key is to not drop it in its entirety because then you're like the industry at large. You don't want to pay people like me to come in and clean up your code base. If you write tests, you'll never have to employ someone like me. All right, Joshua. 
thank you very much for all of these answers. Uh, and actually, we had a lot of questions today. Uh, so it just proves that it was a great talk and great topic to talk about. Um, thank you. Uh, Cheers. Thank you. And uh, see you next time, I guess. All right. <laughs>